I'm not sure about this one. It's fine. Welcome to the Rogue episode, everyone, full of sneaky freaks and thieves and hitmen. And anyone else who likes to be unnoticed. As the president rogues, we can film near anywhere. We're masters of avoiding notice and weaponry. Nobody gets the drop on us once we get some XP, and we're here to prove it. And I don't approve, but need rent. Well, if she's not good for a sneak attack, she's hanging with the wrong crowd. You ready? Let's go! Stop Why screaming and pick up the camera! No, 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 you don't turn that off. I'm professional. I'm always ready. You're really gonna be like this, huh? <clears throat> Okay. Settle in, class. Today we're learning about the rogue. Originally called Thief, but they can be more than that. Only a D8 for HP, pretty low for someone without magic, and the fact that they only get light armor and some pretty weak weaponry doesn't help either. What does help is that they're very good at not getting hit to begin with. Proficiency in dexterity, intelligence, and eventually wisdom, with plenty of skills to choose from like deception and stealth. You also basically have proficiency with proficiency, getting double to some of those bonuses. Your level 2 ability lets you take some extra actions to run, disengage, or hide. At level 5, it's a reaction to have the damage that hits you, and at 7 you take half damage from anything with a deck save, fully cancelling the damage if you pass. At 11 you can't roll under 10 on a skill check, and at 18 attacks can't have advantage on you unless you're incapacitated. Your level 20 capstone is that once per short rest, if your attack misses you can choose to hit anyway, or roll a 20 on any ability check. And speaking of hitting, you might wonder how those hits keep up with everyone else on damage. Things like poison can help, but the main thing you get from the start is sneak attack. If you have advantage on an attack or an allies within 5 feet of the target, deal an increasingly large pile of extra damage on the attack. Just make sure it's a finesse or ranged weapon like a dagger and that you don't have disadvantage from something else. This is the bread and butter of the rogue, making them really feast or famine. You're either stabbing someone with cutlery for like 4 damage, or you're casually rolling more dice in one hit than the barbarian might all fight. It makes them great with a group, though out of all the classes, the rogue ends up on their own the most. Proficiency in thieves tools, great stealth with plenty of skills to capitalize on it, damage output designed around blitzing someone that didn't see you, makes us perfect for getting in and out quick, or getting yourself into trouble with nobody to help. Don't split the party as a rule for a reason. You can Break the rules when you're good enough to get around the danger, but before you do, you gotta know why it's there. And every rogue has a special toolkit to do that, given by their subclass at level 3, 9, 13, and 17. Let's start with a basic one, Assassin. You can poison, disguise yourself, and eventually even create false identities or mimic another person perfectly. Which is cool and all, but we're really here for your other main ability, Assassinate. If you attack someone before they take their first turn, you have advantage on the roll, and if they're surprised, you automatically critical hit. Given that your sneak attack damage is doubled on a crit, you might be starting combat by taking out a third or more of their health taken to an extreme at level 17, with double damage or even instant death. How good the rest of your stuff is depends on how social your game is, but Assassinate alone can carry you pretty well in any campaign. Now I know you hear Assassin and you want to be a fantasy Italian from a time long gone, leaping from high above to instantly kill your foes, and I will admit that Mario is a great way to play it, but he's not the only concept. Maybe you're a little old lady who learned poison from gardening and disguises from helping her community theater. The sneak attacks are from her self-defense classes on the weekends. Maybe you're a surgeon gone rogue, or a method actor taking things way too far, or even that clown I keep trying to get you to play for some reason. It's not my fault, y'all have put that Killer Clowns video as one of my top three played for the week every week since it was released. Blame yourselves. Anyway, I wouldn't use any of those. Slinging poison while changing your look, high persuasion despite low charisma, casually dealing irreparable harm to those around you. You just sound like an average beauty blogger to me. But if you're loving that social aspect, consider the mastermind. Not so many improvements on stabbing, but you learn disguising, forgery, gambling, two languages, and can mimic other people's accents to sound like you're native to the area. You're actually pretty utility focused, getting to use the help action as a bonus action and from 30 feet away if they're attacking, everyone's gonna like you if you're constantly giving them advantage on their attacks, which is a very good thing, because at 13 you can duck behind people to make them take an attack for you. Try to use it on enemies if you can. At 17 you can't be affected by mind reading without consent, can try to bluff people you do allow to read your mind, or even bluff magic itself by making spells like Zone of Truth always say you're being truthful. Probably won't be used, but it's cool. Oh, and uh, at level 9 you can observe a creature for a minute to tell if it's smarter, wiser, charisma, or a higher level than you. Only two at a time though, let's not get overzealous here. Look, if you're playing this, just make sure you're in an intrigue heavy game or a short one. Nobody mentions this, but if you're only playing until level 8, you only get your level 3 ability. So while the Mastermind's later abilities can be situational at best, if you're playing a low to mid level campaign, you're not really going to be that behind or ahead with most of these. I like using these for the unassuming character. Your darling Southern Belle socialite who can still strike like a viper. A halfling posing as a human child to gather and sell info. Distracting foes by yelling out secrets. An 
unassuming accountant forging numbers and trying to flee his mafia ties. Okay, I've got to admit that one's a little bit tame. I expected the mastermind to have a lot more intelligence abilities. Honestly, my money's on the inquisitive for cleverness. You can't roll lower than an 8 when using insight to tell if someone's lying, and you can also make an insight check to sneak attack someone without advantage. Eventually, you'll even start to do more damage if you sneak attack people that way. Looking for hidden things or deciphering clues is also a bonus action, which is pretty niche but can really help with some kinds of puzzles. Speaking of which, level 9 gives you advantage on perception and investigation if you're only moving at half speed. And if that's somehow still not enough, level 13 lets you sense all shapeshifters, illusions, and any other magic trying to trick you within 30 feet. You don't know all the specifics and you can only do it a few times a day, but it's still pretty useful if your DM's tricky. And honestly, that's the main reason you would use an inquisitive to begin with. It's another social-based rogue, even more than the mastermind. It really focuses on the utility and skill-based side of the rogue. Now obviously this is supposed to be an investigator of some kind, but from detectives to superheroes to a party of teenagers and their pet, that still leaves you plenty of space to work in. Why are you so perceptive? Are you a prodigy or is it years of training? Are you a massive nerd who read too many novels and learned all the tropes? Or an ancient criminal come out of retirement who knows all the tricks because they came up with most of them? Maybe all your guesses are right for the wrong reasons. Or you notice things by just happening to trip into them. Maybe your vague feelings are the constant whispering of swirling spirits. And speaking about spirits, what about the phantom? It's basically an elevation of that last concept. You've walked the line of life and death so much that you're attuned to it. Ear to the wall, hearing the whispers of the dead. Those whispers let you swap out one of your proficiencies on a short rest. They can also turn into soul-rending screams when you sneak attack someone a few times a day, letting you roll half of those dice again to attack someone else with necrotic damage. At 17, you can do that to two people, letting you tear through minions while fighting the boss. At level 9, those you see die join your chorus, trapped inside a small trinket. You can actually have a few saved up, and just having one on you gives you advantage on con saves and death saves. You can also shatter one to use that stab and a half feature without using a charge. Or you can break it to ask the soul inside a question, but they're allowed to lie, so there's usually not much point. You can also shatter it to recharge your once per day ghost walk ability. This allows you to basically turn into a ghost. You can slowly fly, walk through walls, attacks against you have disadvantage, and it can last for 10 minutes. It is perfect for scouting. Come to think of it, it really does make sense that the rogue subclasses are so hit or miss. Kind of the rogue's whole deal. And this one is a fantastic hit. I know, I'm a sucker for the whole grave collar edge, but it's just so cool. But if this isn't your aesthetic for some reason, the big question is what else is helping you? You can switch the undead influence with fiends and most people wouldn't even notice, but what about the earth itself? The spirit of the land whispers to you, binding foes in wicker effigy and making them wither around you as you drive wooden daggers into them. Go for more of a holy route with the extra attacks as smites, ripping the life from foes as you forcibly wrench their souls from their body and into the afterlife. And of course there's plenty of evil pay to draw upon, or just go with a sort of psychic rogue, saving imperfect copies of your foe's mind, and dealing necrotic damage by just physically ripping the blood from their body with your brain. Though I admit that is a bit of a stretch. The true psychic rogue already exists with soul knife. Okay, so you have psychic powers, shown by a pool of dice, you spend them to use your abilities and can regain one for short rest, but it takes a long rest to get them all back. For example, if you fail at a skill you're proficient in, you can roll one of these dice and add the number to the check, only spending the dice if you succeed. That is their other main trick. Most of these don't make you spend the dice unless it actually worked, though some just can't fail, like Psychic Whispers. It lets you connect a few creatures together mentally, and you can just talk freely as long as you're within a mile. But your main feature is Psychic Blades. You make a knife out of mental energy. It's throwable, it deals psychic damage, and you can summon a second weaker one if you have a free hand, so you're never unarmed. At level 9, you can roll one of your dice and add that number to the attack roll, and as a bonus action, you can throw a blade and teleport to it. At 13, you can turn invisible, and at 17, you can stun someone by jamming your blades into their brain. You can only do it once per long rest, but you can spend 3 dice to recharge it early. And I am sorry that was a long one. But basically anything involving psionics seems to be so much wordier than its magical counterpart. On the bright side, we finally have a throwing weapons rogue. Of course, the issue on my end is that this one really knows what it is. Psychic damage is very specific about its sources. Maybe you could go an Eldric Horrors route, turn the knives into grasping tentacles appearing below them, warping through cracks in reality. But I find the more fruitful way to customize is to explain how it's doing the damage. Are you giving them many PTSD attacks, blasting all of their traumas at once? Because those knives leave no physical wounds, it's all going to the brain and soul. Maybe you're spiking them with beer to stop their heart, or overloading their spine, or racking their nerves with phantom pain. An Eldric one could overwhelm their mind with horror and impossible knowledge, or you could just make them so happy they die. A much more extreme version of what happens when you leave me a comment, hit that sub button, or give me a thumbs up. Ha ha, very funny, I meant the button. Ring that bell so it'll be more likely to show up on your recommended bar, since you might just accidentally overlook my thumbnail in the sub feed. No hard feelings, I know it happens, especially if you're like me and have 520 subscriptions. Why? Well, excuse me for liking things. I still run out of videos all the time. Most of them only upload every few weeks or months, or just disappeared. Besides, a lot of classic people on here. And speaking of classic, the Swashbuckler. Probably not the first to come to mind, but it's about as traditional as you can get for the concept 
concept of a rogue. Flamboyant fencers, pirates, the classic hidden heart of gold who might break yours on the cover of a romance novel. Their fancy footwork means that creatures they attack can't counter with an opportunity attack, letting them dance in and out of range without consequence. Eventually, they even get advantage on athletics and acrobatics with their elegant maneuvering. Their spicy suaveness lets them add charisma to their initiative, and they can always sneak attack in a close quarters duel, as long as they don't have disadvantage. At level 9, you can make a persuasion check to taunt them into that duel, making it hard for their foes to look away. You can also use this on people who aren't hostile to you to charm them, except unlike most other methods of charming, there's no limitation and they aren't aware you charm them. I mean, it just makes sense because there's no tricks or magic. You're just that suave, no one can hate you. Oh, and their last thing lets them re-roll a missed attack with advantage once per short rest. Depending on how often you stop, that can be pretty good. Just like everything else, I mean, you have a rogue who can talk their way out of nearly anything and is great in a duel when that fails. Mechanically wonderful and thematically, I mean, this is Zoro, Captain Jack, Puss in Boots, Inigo Montoya, the mist goes on. I know I'm supposed to be giving weird takes in this section, but the swashbuckler is already a weird take. It's a rogue encouraging you to be loud and boastful and charming. And yeah, I mean, you're able to ignore it. Turn it into a sort of laser-focused secret agent slipping through combat with unerring skill. You could make it some sort of weird psionic charming ability, psychically warding things off and physically turning people's heads towards you. And of course, the naturalistic take, slipping around with bestial instinct and charming people through pheromones. But you can have fun with that. After all, why miss your chance to be boisterous? If you don't like to be that sort of mold breaker, however, we'll just go back to basics with the most classic of all, the thief. You can do things like opening locks, using items, or use sleight of hand as a bonus action, letting you tear through an enemy mansion in a moment. And that's assuming you even bothered to use a door instead of using your climb speed to clamber through a window. Eventually, you gain advantage on stealth when creeping around, and can ignore most magic item requirements to make sure that loot is always worth it. Everything they get is great for stealth work, though it takes a bit of a turn at level 17. It's a beautifully simple ability. On the first round of combat, you take an extra turn. Either get a head start that few can hope to match, or just drop 22d6 on their head before they can move. But aside from that late game power jump, the thief is basically what people think of when they think rogue. You're an infiltration specialist, a spy, a ninja. This is your classic rogue from the dungeon crawl days, except a 2e thief player would have killed for half of these abilities. But what this rogue especially highlights is something that's true for all rogues. Items are your friend. Cow chops and ball bearings stop pursuers and put distance between you and an enemy. If someone gets downed, you're great with a potion or even a healer's kit if you got it. Oils and poisons are amazing for someone relying on one big attack, and this all goes double for a thief who can do this as a bonus action while running to or from a fight. And that's not even mentioning how your high dexterity makes you great with thrown weapons like acid and knives. Look at all your skills, you are a mundane person keeping up with mages and divine warriors and whatever the hell the barbarian's on. You're the person with a backup plan who understands a calculated risk. There are so many consumables and tools, use them. But if you're after a similar feel or play style with different abilities, you just don't want to think about items, we need to talk about the scout. The scout is like if you removed the love of nature from a ranger, which would make a lot more sense if y'all didn't cut in line. Surprise! Making the ranger sad is not a surprise. Anyway, forget the ranger, this is the scout. The lookout who runs through the wilderness ahead of the party, or the solo hunter eliminating targets on the road. You're double proficient in nature and survival, and specialize in movement. You can use your reaction to move half your speed without opportunity attacks if someone steps close. You also get 10 extra feet of movement, as well as swim or climb if you already can. You're also almost always gonna move first, because at level 13 you have advantage on initiative, and if you land a hit, everyone gets advantage on attacks against that target for one round. And finally, at level 17, you can make an attack as a bonus action, and it can even sneak attack if it's not against the same person. Now, the flavor text isn't wrong, they do great running alongside barbarians and rangers and such, but they can sprint through town and bonk you just as well. You're the smash and grab counterpart to the thieves calm burglary. Sure, you're probably a bounty hunter or whatever, but you could just as easily be some sort of messed up boy scout with a horrific game attack. You could even make a good assassin who just assumes they'll eventually trip the alarm. Or you could just be panicking, freak out, rush in, stab something with everything you got while cackling in fear, then get out before any survivors even know what hit him. Hey, it works! I know, longest live scout in your tribe. Point is that the reason behind your abilities can tell a story. Your nature knowledge might come from the wilderness, or from studying poison and practical skills for ruthless assassination. Your movement might come from your former life as an athlete, and your reaction times from paranoid twitching instead of honed skill. Maybe your sneak attacks are just luck, and you're unreadable because you're only half-conscious from panic. You're masters of ambush and creeping through the undergrowth. And good at hunting. You'll never escape a scout. Or catch one once you run after the first round. <laughs> oh, don't think you're off the hook. Let's see what kind of arcane tricks your kind stir up. Seems like the arcane trickster's main thing is mage hand. You can also make it invisible, pick locks or pockets, plant items on people, disarm traps while far away, and you can even use sleight of hand to do it sneakily. It's also only a bonus action to control it. Eventually, it even becomes a flanking buddy, giving you advantage while it taps them on the shoulder or tickles them or whatever. And it's not even your only spell. You get two and eventually three more cantrips, as well as actual spells. Most of them have to be illusion or enchantment 
enchantment, but as a rogue that's most of what you'd want anyway, so it's not too bad. Especially because you have magical ambush. Anyone you cast a spell on has disadvantage on the saving throw if you're hidden when you cast, which means you could be better at enchantment spells than the enchantment wizard. And let's not forget level 17, spell thief. Is it always useful? Absolutely not. But is pickpocketing the wizard's brain amazing? Absolutely. You even negate the spell's effect on you while you rip the knowledge out of their head. You can be a wizard with their own spell that they no longer know for eight hours. I'm glad most rogues don't have magic. They are terrifying when they do. The arcane trickster just doubles down on everything the rogue's good at, but with magical enhancements. Pickpocket a weapon or potion from an enemy before the battle. Unlock a door and open it for a distraction. And let's not forget that you're a rogue with spells like Hold Person, Invisibility, Sleep, and Silvery Barbs. Arcane tricksters can tend to be a little one note, but it's a really good note. You can flavor your power as Psionic or a little summoned creature doing all the work, but the Mage Hand focus really does pitch and hold their flavoring. So instead, focus on how you got that power. Did you run out of tuition money for wizard school and turn to a life of crime? Is this some sort of pact you made with a tricky little fang? Are you an explorer who just focused on practical magic? Or a noble learning espionage to plant forgeries on rivals? Or a barber who specialized in dangerous plants and got used to sneaking because it's your best defense as a commoner? Or maybe... <sighs> Fine, keep your secrets. Overall, the rogue subclasses are pretty nice. If you want that all or nothing playstyle for a gambler's thrill, what could be better? Now, if your issue is the theme, you might want to try monk. And if your issue is the frailty, you might want to try ranger. And of course, if you truly want that gambling feel in a mage, try wizard. No gagging this time. Look, I'll lean into my anti-wizard agenda at work, but it's really just the constant elitism that I care about. And Amelia proves that they aren't all bad. Speaking of which, she is almost here, so let's wrap this up. Thanks to Modern Masquerade and Feral Goblin as always, your support lets me buy things for the show. If you want to join him, the link to my coffee is in the description. Anyway, class dismissed. So we done, because my voice is shot and I got a new kind of Moscato I am dying to try. So you knew we were here early. I'm a goblin witch living alone in the woods with magical hallucinations of arguable reality. You think I let anything get near here without me knowing? Besides, I make enemies just by existing. And even more when I open my mouth. Then why are you in a tower? Because we're filming and the boss gets weird about me wearing things for modesty instead of just practicality and fashion, hypocrite. How is that weird? Because we're kobolds and goblinoids? <laughs> what, were you raised by dwarves or something? Human actually. Oh, then I'm glad you finally showed up to a drinking night. Turn that off and grab a drink. I'll teach you something. And I'll put on clothes if it makes you feel more comfortable. I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, Guck, can you go tell Amelia to cover up? But, but she's a halfway. If you're fine with necromancy, but not with nudity, we really need to get your priorities straight. 